Hi, I'm John DeVore. Welcome to the channel. Today is finally uh, a rant. I know I've been talking about having another rant for quite some time and I, it's uh, the, uh, the stars have aligned and uh, so I thought I might rant a bit today. <laughs> so bear with me. Today's rant it has to do with measurements in hi-fi audio. So the, the, the relevance, importance, and the meaning, and the interpretation of measurements in high-end audio. That's what this rant is about. And I'm definitely, I am not the first person to rant about this particular topic, nor do I think that I have any sort of a unique perspective on this. But one of the things that, that I see currently is this way that measurements have sort of become weaponized over the past 10 years, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, for me, the negative elements of it in my, you know, as far as I, while I was observing them, go all the way back to the 70s and 80s. So this is sort of after the, the golden age of Macintosh, Marantz, Harman Kardon, vacuum tube amplifiers, and through the, the 50s and 60s. And in the 70s, as transistors became really cheap, they became really mass produced, and transistors uh, made their way into everything, including high-end audio. Um, and for a while, the receiver wars so brands like uh, Pioneer, Sansui, Sony, they were making these more and more impressive hi-fi receivers. And these were receivers that were not aimed at the bottom end of the market. They were not aimed at being a sort of a mainstream mass market product. These were receivers that a lot of technology was going into. They were being built to very, very high quality standards and they had real beefy amplifiers, enormous power supplies, very high sensitivity tuners, very low noise phono sections. And so these were really state-of-the-art receivers. And, and these receivers could be the, the core of a very good hi-fi system um, all through the, the 70s. But what gradually started to happen, first it became sort of a specification war where each new set of amplifiers started to have more power, more tape loops, more meters, and, and there was a sort of a spec war. And then what started to happen is that that spec war turned to, uh, it started becoming less about how much power and how big the power supply was and how much the receiver weighed to becoming a pure specifications war. And it tended to be based around this combination of um, output power, so the power amplifier capability, and the distortion percentage, the sort of THD, the total harmonic distortion, which is expressed in a percentage. So if you have 50% THD, it means 50% of what's coming through is pure distortion, and it's gonna sound awful. If you have 1% THD, it's gonna sound uh, far better because there's a much lower percentage of what's coming through that particular measured component uh, is distortion. And so what started happening at the end of the 70s and all through the 80s is that these specifications became essentially the sole marketing tool for these companies. And then these receivers started to become far more cheaply made because what was happening is that the engineers were focusing entirely on these two specifications. How much power could they output and how low was the distortion in that, uh, in that power delivery? And they started to narrow the parameters. And so the THD percentage would be based on a one kilohertz tone. So we're not talking about broadband, entire frequency response measurements. We are talking about how much power and how low the distortion is at one kilohertz tone. It is about as far away from music as you can get, and yet it was incredibly powerful in marketing brochures. So what we see happening through the 80s is that these receivers 
start to have more and more impressive specifications across a narrower and narrower and narrower purview. And, this, and the receivers themselves start to become cheaper, more poorly made, and worse um, significantly. So they became objectively and subjectively terrible, even though that particular measurement uh, got better and better and better. Their, their total harmonic distortion percentage went from 1% to 0.1% to 0.01%, 0.0001%. And they, they started to make these extremely narrowly capable audio devices that were very good at producing extremely low THD at this, in this very narrow measurement window. And really they weren't very good at much else. You can maybe see it as, as sort of the equivalent of, there are these YouTube musicians, uh, YouTube guitarists and YouTube drummers who are really sort of astonishing at, at certain things. So you get these guitar players who can just shred. They can, they can play so many notes. They're fitting so many notes per second. Or these YouTube drummers who can do these mind-bogglingly fast single stroke rolls. And it's like saying that by these metrics, these are better players. Those, these YouTube guitar players are better than, a, say, a Joe Pass. And that these YouTube drummers are better than, say, John Bonham. Because they can single stroke four times as fast as Bonzo can. And while these assessments can be thought of as accurate in a way, in that within this narrow context, they are better at this specific thing, to then be able to say universally that that makes that drummer better than John Bonham or that makes this guitar player better than a Joe Pass is a fallacy. There's no equivalency there. You're, you're doing a, there's a sleight of hand happening there. And that's really kind of what was happening during the end of the receiver wars through the 80s. And that was exacerbated a little bit by, uh, by early uh, digital. So when Sony and Philips were designing the, the, the standard that would become the CD, the 16-bit 44.1 kilohertz oversampling format that became the digital recording method for CD release. Uh, they had listening panels, and in those listening panels, Sony and Philips researchers understood that many listeners could actually perceive frequencies above 20,000 hertz. And yet, because of financial reasons and practical reasons, they decided to make the standard of the CD only able to record frequencies up to 20,000 hertz. And that had its own repercussions um, in the sort of measuring wars uh, of, of all through the 80s and 90s. To some extent, it sort of exacerbated this idea that humans can't hear above 20,000 hertz and that brought on, in speakers at least, that brought on all these hard dome tweeters, these uh, early uh, aluminum and titanium, and then some of these uh, Kevlar and ceramic, these tweeters that had really terrible ringing up around 20,000 hertz, 19K, 20K, uh, 21, 22K, and they misbehaved terribly. But the reviewers, in summarizing these measurements where there's obvious uh, problems up at the top of the frequency response, they would rationalize it by saying, well, humans aren't, humans can't hear anything above 20,000 hertz anyway. So it, it sort of, it, it heralded in a little bit of a dark age uh, in high-end audio. And what really sort of has to happen is that measurement techniques have to evolve. They're, they have to sort of be dragged along by advances in technology, but also by new data, new information, and the, and the overall accumulation of experiential data. And measurement techniques, for, for the most part, do sort of get, get dragged along as higher resolution um, digital files started to come out that did have frequencies above 20,000 hertz. Uh, the bandwidth of the measuring had to increase as well, and perhaps more critical analysis could be aimed at those frequencies that were, that were originally sort of thrown out with the bathwater. It's funny, uh, in, the, in the late 80s and the early 90s, when high-end audio was, was starting to get their hands on digital, 
one of the early companies, Wadia, started to, to make uh, digital decoding their own. And one of the things that they had decided was that that hard edge at 20,000 hertz that beyond which CDs could not reproduce was becoming problematic. And it, because it was such a hard edge, problems from that type of a filter were having effects in other ways. So it's not just what was happening in the frequency response, but that hard edge was causing uh, effects in other things like the time domain. And so what Wadia started to do was that they were making their own filters that behaved better in the time domain. They behaved more like real sound uh, and real experiential music listening in the time domain, and they were sacrificing a little bit of that linearity in the frequency domain. And so in that sense, these early Wadias, based on the measurement standards of the time, measured more poorly than some cheap Sony CD player However, they sounded significantly superior. And so gradually the, the, the reviewers' measurement tools needed to broaden and they started to include things like time domain behavior. They started to include things like jitter uh, performance um, to the more common frequency responses and uh, distortion spectrum, things like that. In a scientist's hands, Measurements are intended to explain phenomenon. They're, they're, they're intended to try to quantify. They're intended to try to analyze things that are being experienced in the real world to some extent. But in the wrong hands, measurements can also very easily mislead uh, or oversimplify uh, things. So over the course of thousands of years, our Earth, which is perceived as a, as a flat plane, went from being a flat disk to being a sphere with the sun that rotated around it to becoming uh, a sphere that actually rotated around this distant object that was the sun. And that became very elegantly explained um, with Newtonian physics. But when Newtonian physics began to show some limitations, uh, Einstein and relativity uh, step in and then that starts to show a, a lack of, of completeness or a lack of resolution. We get quantum theories. So science and measurements need to be fluid. They need to, they, they keep moving. They need to keep moving in order to catch up with experiential data that comes in. So science and its ability to measure have to continue to evolve in order to keep up with the increased body of experiential data. And this idea that we know all there is to know about X, therefore anything that doesn't fit within these very strict measurement parameters doesn't exist or isn't important, is incredibly unscientific. The scientists would say, so this particular set of measurements doesn't seem to correlate with this particular set of experiences so why is that? And let's try to find a new set of measurements that may better correlate to empirical evidence. But it is sort of in human nature to be polarized. There was a, um, there was a, a famous stereophile cover, it must have been in the 90s, that had uh, two amplifiers on the cover. It had a big Krell power amplifier, big solid state, very high power amplifier, and then it had a carry tube amplifier. It was a, a single-ended triode tube amplifier. And the headline was something like, if one of these amplifiers is perfect, then the other one must be wrong, or something like that. And yet in the magazine, both of those amplifiers got rave reviews, and both of those are quite highly regarded even to this day. There are a number of very well-respected high-end audio designers that understand well this fact that the standard suite of, uh, of audio measurements don't necessarily correlate to better sounding components. People like Nelson Pass have discussed how distortion is not necessarily related to the perception of better transparency. Or someone like uh, Mike Moffat, who started out years ago at Theta. Theta was actually doing something similar to Wadia back in the day. They were making their own digital filters and their digital analog converters. But Mike Moffat's current company, 
is called Shit. And they actually have two different versions of one of their little amplifiers. I think it's a headphone amplifier. And they make two versions of it. Both of them cost the same. One of them is an all discrete circuit and it is the one that they uh, originally presented and it's the one that by all accounts sounds better. But then for the exact same price, they also make one that is made with a whole bunch of op amps that measures much more perfectly. So you can buy the one that's an all discrete circuit that probably sounds a lot better, or you can buy the one that's all op amps that measures better. There was another uh, component, a great American company, Air in Colorado. They make uh, digital products as well, but their, their original digital analog converter had a switch on the back and it said, listen and measure. The two positions on the switch were listen and measure. And sure enough, in the uh, stereo file review, when they, when they did the measurements, you could see the difference in the two and it was something to do with the, with the slope on the top. Um, I actually did a similar thing. So I definitely don't wanna make this about, uh, about the speakers that we design here. But this is a long discontinued uh, product, so I just want to use this as an example. So the the Silverback, this was our very first flagship reference speaker. Um, and I was designing this starting in about 2002, 2003, 2004. In 2003, I got my first full measurement suite. So this is a, a computerized system of hardware and software that could do gated measurements. It could do uh, all and all kinds of sweeps. It could do time domain measurements. It could also do uh, simulations, crossover network simulations, and things like that. And the Silverback was the first speaker that that was designed with the benefit uh, of this system. And one of the things that I saw was that there was this one aspect in the lower mid range, upper upper bass, that if I made this if I made the speakers sound their best. They didn't measure perfectly. And if I made them measure perfectly, I lost a little something in that, in that range. And so what I did is I put a switch on the back of the Silverbacks and I labeled it uh, HT and Direct. And essentially HT was like a measure position and Direct was the listen position. And when they went off to be reviewed by Stereophile, the, the reviewer, the, the subjective reviewer, the listener, uh, which was Michael Fremer, he, he gave them a great review. They made it into Stereophile Class A recommended components. And he said in the body of the, of the review that he tried both the HD and the direct and preferred them uh, every time in the direct position. So when John Atkinson did the measurements on the speakers, he saw the same thing and he talks about the anomaly he sees in the direct position that is not there in the HT position. Which is to say that we don't always necessarily understand how what we're measuring relates to what we are hearing. Or at the very least, it's not as simple as a lot of people make it out to be. There are reviewers who have made entire careers. There, is, there are websites based on this whole principle that this sort of simple set of measurements is all you need to know in order to recommend or not recommend X, Y, or Z hi-fi component. And it is at its core utterly unscientific. A scientist knows fundamentally that any measurement is not going to give you the, the, all of the information, the complete story of what is being measured. It's inherently part of the scientific method. Uh, and that's why the scientific method continues to be this sort of circular thing where new observations and new data come in and force measurements to adapt and to change uh, in order to incorporate the new data into the new model of what it is that's being observed. And one of the biggest problems with the scientific method is not the method itself. And it's not that it doesn't work because it works beautifully. Uh, and it is how we have gotten where we have gotten. One of the biggest problems with it is a public relations problem. There's this meme I found last week, and it's one of the things that really got me thinking about this, this topic again. And in it, we have a, a scientist, and the, the scientist is saying, my discoveries are useless if taken out of context. And then below that, 
the media is saying, scientists, scientists claim their discoveries are useless. And that really perfectly sums up a lot of current media's coverage of, of science. Uh, it's, it's so easy to be able to claim a, a certain set of measurements describes 100% of some hi-fi component, even though that is scientifically absurd and it utterly does not. It's this sort of idea, it becomes a sort of very dogmatic technology stops here. We now know everything and no new data that doesn't fit within this bubble that I have measured is relevant. And it is completely anti-science. It's a, it's a dogmatic sort of cultism. And you, get a, and you end up getting these sort of polarized uh, groups. You sort of get the hedonistic horny hordes and the, the fascist... Floyd O'Toole's and the ordained order of first order. You know, it's like in the speaker world, you, you have these these camps and everyone else is wrong. Uh, there's only one, there's only my way to do it. And the, and the last thing I want to talk about in this, in this topic is sort of the why. Why don't the measurements equal the listening experience? We're an incredibly advanced society. Why can't this equal this? And to talk about that, we have to talk about what it is to experience a high-end audio system. So what is happening? How does hi-fi even work? How on earth can these little vibrations that are pushed out into the air somehow magically recreate for humans the sensation of musicians playing instruments and playing music in the room with them. It's really quite astonishing that it even works at all. And it's something that I, I think about a lot, of being in this industry and also just being curious about that particular thing. It, it is really sort of astonishing to me that it works and that it works so well. It, it really can work incredibly well sitting in front of a, of a really well set up hi-fi system, maybe with eyes closed and immersing yourself in a musical performance that is not happening, that is nothing more than vibrations in the air emanating from two points in space that happen to be in this room. It's really remarkable. Uh, and to talk about that a little bit, I want to step back when I was probably six or seven maybe, I remember a toy that I had, and, and it's, it's one of the most vivid memories that I have of that time when I was a child. And the toy was a, it was a plastic robot called King Ding, and it came with an assortment of smaller robots. And these smaller robots had different jobs, essentially. And one of them was named Brain, and that one its job was to go up in this little elevator inside of King Ding and it would ride around in its head and it essentially controlled this bigger robot, the King Ding. So the King Ding would kind of cruise around in its crude plasticky D battery powered way and it was controlled by this smaller robot named Brain. And that is certainly how I imagined I was I would sometimes, I had a long walk to school, and a lot of the times to kill, to, to kill time, I would imagine myself essentially the same as King Ding, and I would imagine my brain being inside my head at a big control panel, and, the, and, and brain, my brain inside my head, would be looking out the two windows of my eyes, it would be hearing through the two speakers and microphones of my ears and it would be controlling my arms and legs as I walked to school in the mornings. And it's a very likable image. It's a very easy to understand concept of how maybe we are. Uh, this idea that we are a mind inside the head and that mind is looking out our eyes and it is hearing out of our ears and it is a uh, feeling with the tips of our fingers. And it's, uh, it becomes, because we have this sort of idea, this sort of separation of ourselves from the world, we sort of, we perceive 
ourselves as separate. We perceive ourselves as being inside our mind looking out. Uh, and so we are separate from all of these other things. So if we are a little mind uh, inside our heads looking out our eyes, what is that little mind doing? How is that little mind controlling things? Is there another mind further inside that mind that is looking out that mind's eye? And then in turn, inside that, is there an even more inner mind? And all of a sudden you start to get this fractal uh, universe and it starts to become turtles all the way down. And the analogy breaks down as you get to infinity. I guess there's a comfort in, to believe in the simplicity that a microphone and an analyzer work the same way as our ears and our auditory cortex. But measurement instruments do, are, do not work in the same way that humans work. It's a fallacy to equate the two. And this was shown in great detail to me when I was part of a, a, a team that made a film last year about an extraordinary audiophile named Bob Lichtenberg. And the film is, it's a short film called Listening. Uh, I will definitely post a link to it. And what makes Bob extraordinary as an audiophile, among many things, but the most obvious one is that he is deaf. He cannot hear anything through his ears. And yet he is a sensitive enough audiophile to be able to tell uh, if a cable has been changed in his system. He's a, a bit of a deadhead and he can follow solos by the various members of the Grateful Dead with far greater acuity than I certainly could. He's a remarkable man and an extremely sensitive audiophile. How does he hear? He has remapped his auditory system so that his auditory cortex in his brain is now receiving the stimulus instead of from his ears, from his hands. Bob holds a Mylar balloon in his hands when he's listening and his body has mapped his fingertips to his auditory cortex so that neurologically he is having a very similar experience to something that I would have sitting in front of a hi-fi system. His brain is painting the same vivid sound stage that I get when I listen to music from a hi-fi. And it's a profoundly remarkable thing. And what it tells me is that we don't know what we think we know about how hi-fi works. So since being involved with that film, I've been digging into more modern thinking on the science of consciousness, what it means to be conscious, uh, and then the theory of mind. So if Bob and I can both have a very similar hi-fi experience, what does that mean? Both of us are essentially recreating a musical event based on a massively incomplete sensory input. In Bob's case, it's, it's obvious because of how radically different the mechanical apparatus is that he's using to create the music in his head. But the same can be said of the auditory stimulus that I'm receiving through my ears. It is massively incomplete, and yet our minds are able to create this beautiful, detailed, realistic, three-dimensional musical experience in front of us. How the fuck does that work? So let's first dismiss this idea that, that the mind is like that tiny robot inside our heads at the control panels, listening to the hi-fi through my ears as though there's a smaller pair of speakers inside my head. What's really inside my head? What's really inside my head is a squishy organ called the brain living in a pitch black, damp cave. Pitch black, sealed 100%. There's no windows where there's eyes. There's no, no light is getting in. The brain is receiving, at, a, at any given moment, the brain is receiving all kinds of, of stimuli from outside of its pitch black, damp little cave. How is it sorting it out and making sense of any of it? So what the brain is doing is something that actually Helmholtz said at the, uh, at the very end of the 1800s. He called it unconscious inference. It's the idea that the brain is a continuously running prediction machine and that all the sensory inputs are doing is adding a, a correction signal to these predictions. So one of the ways of describing it is that we are essentially living a controlled hallucination, that 100% of what we perceive as reality, 
all of the sensory inputs, the, the taste, the visual stimula, audible stimula, touch, smell, everything is a creation of the brain in this controlled hallucination. And the controlled hallucination is ongoing, moment to moment, and the information that's coming through our various senses is adding to make it as accurate a representation uh, of what might be out there as our brain knows how to do. So for example, when I perceive a coffee mug, what I am perceiving is not carried in the, on the input signals from my visual cortex. What I am perceiving is my brain's best guess at explaining the various sensory inputs that I'm experiencing. Uh, and one of the things that's related to that is this idea of objecthood. So when I perceive a mug, I'm perceiving this mug far more than just the way it feels in my hand and the way the light is reflecting off of the white, off of the, the rainbow apple, off of the text here. I'm actually perceiving this as an object. In a sense, I, I, I can sense the, the side of the mug that I can't see. I'm not seeing this. There's no, none of my senses can possibly be aware in any, in, in, in any way of this, uh, this part of the mug, or for that matter, of the inside of the mug. And yet I know they're there and they are part of my perception of this mug. So we know that that's not a sensory input. What that is, is objecthood. And that is a part of this controlled hallucination that is creating this mug from moment to moment. And it's that objecthood that makes hi-fi work. Again, our brains are sitting in our damp, dark cave in our head, continuously creating a reality for us based on sensory input. So when we listen to the hi-fi, when, when I put on a, a record, maybe I dim the lights, maybe I close my eyes, I am maybe to some extent willing my mind to control the hallucination to put Jimmy Page playing the guitar right there, Robert Plant singing right there, John Paul Jones playing bass, and Bonzo in the back on the drums. That controlled hallucination paints that picture, paints that picture vividly based on sensory input coming in. We know already that the brain is very good at making a complete picture out of incomplete data. And so that's what it's doing in the case of listening to music on a hi-fi. The data coming off of my Zeppelin record is extremely incomplete. And yet, somehow, I am able to hear very clearly all the nuance of Jimmy Page's Les Paul plugged into his amp, the way his fingers and the pick are on the strings. It's recreated so perfectly because that is what our brains do all the time. It is what our brains have evolved to do. It is one thing that our brains are extremely good at. And I just, I am so thankful that someone uh, 150 or so years ago figured out a way to fool our brains into believing, it, uh, to some extent, believing there is a musical performance happening in front of us. There's an, artist, there's an artistic term from the early 20th century called the beholder's share. And what it's referring to is essentially the, the beholder of the art. So the viewer of the, of the painting, uh, let's, say it's a, a, let's say that it's an impressionist painting. The viewer of that painting is filling in all the missing information. So an impressionistic painting, for, as, a, as a great example, bears very little objective resemblance to a scene that it is painting, let's say uh, a Monet cathedral painting or Pizarro landscape. There's very little objective correlation between one of those impressionistic paintings and the actual subject of that painting. And yet our minds are able to make a landscape out of that Pizarro, or they're able to see the light falling on the stonework of a cathedral in that, Mo in that Monet painting. And that's called the beholder's share. And the beholder's share is what is responsible for making high-end audio reproduction work so well. The beholder's share is, is significant. The beholder's share is filling in all those missing details. It is giving 
these little vibrations in the air objecthood. It is making them three-dimensional. It is giving them form, it is giving them placement, tonality, timbre, and it is constructing these beautiful musical events in front of us. And I am just, for I for one, am so happy that it works as well as it does. I love it. I find it miraculous. Every time I become truly immersed in a, in a recording, I do. I find it miraculous, it's soothing, educational, calming, and absolutely nothing like a measurement microphone and an analyzer program. Well, that's my rant. Uh, I guess it went on pretty long. I'm going to edit this down to something that's coherent. Thank you for watching, and I will see you at the next video.